Hello and welcome to Greater Somerville for January 16, 2018. I'm Joe Lynch. Tonight my guest is the founder, publisher, and editor of Cambridge Day, the, on, the web-based hyperlocal news source in Cambridge and beyond. It is my pleasure to welcome back to Greater Somerville for his third appearance, Mark Levy. It is wonderful to be here. Thank you. It's always wonderful to be back in Somerville though, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I spend an awful lot of time in Somerville. It's a good thing you said that because people are saying, why is Joe Lynch having a guy from Cambridge back on his show again? Because I'd say most of my actual work is done in Somerville. I, I happen to know that because your office hours are held at almost every cafe throughout this city. True? Uh, it is true. True. If, uh, if the diesel Ford's Block 11 people open something <laughs> in Cambridge, I might, that might tilt in Cambridge's favor, but uh, yeah, here there I you am. go. Well, we were talking earlier before the show opened, we were talking about some of the, um, some of the major things that are happening in both cities, both Cambridge and Somerville, is the small, long time stalwarts of community based coffee shops or sandwich shops or restaurants are now being gobbled up by the big major corporations. We can talk about that a little later, but I thought we would open up um, the 2018 series of Greater Somerville's talking about our president. Now I say that loosely, I, I say it very loosely because there are some people who take objection um, to that saying he's not my president, but our mayor the mayor of Cambridge is uh, one of those people who... Um, Mark McGovern. Mark McGovern yep. has a, a stand that he will not refer to President Trump until President Trump starts acting like a president. You know, Mark, I mean, you and I have known each other for years. You write a lot about politics in Cambridge. I do a lot of political shows here in Somerville. And I think my general feeling is we have to pay attention to what he's doing, whether we think he's our president or not we still have to pay attention to what he's doing, um, whether it's for good or ill. But uh, last week, he seems to have put his proverbial uh, both feet in his mouth. Um, you want to talk about that for a little bit? Uh, I, it's almost more extraordinary how the Republican Party responds to this than it is what the president does, uh, if only because the Republican Party has for so long portrayed itself in a very specific way. We're the party of Lincoln. We're the party that you can rely on. We're the party of uh, you know fiscal responsibility and right. family values. And uh, it has just been amazing to see the entire party sort of uh, do extraordinary gymnastics to sort of... Uh, last week we had the, uh, the amazing shithouse comment yep. about immigration, where immigration is coming from. And the Republican defense of this is that the president did not say shithole, he said shithouse. Right. Which is right. an amazing defense because uh, they're both, like, uh, one is just dictionary defined as a very bad place to be and the other is dictionary defined as being a toilet. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just. It boggles my mind that we have, we have degraded ourselves as, as a, an entity in this world. We have degraded ourselves into debating the meaning of the word shithole versus shithouse. Yes. Now, for those people who watch this show, they know that I have not once uttered a vulgarity on this show in the 10 years that I've been doing it. But I refuse to sit by and let CNN have all the fun <laughs> by saying shithole, shithouse every 10 minutes. Everyone from Anderson Cooper to Chris Cuomo to everybody else, they have been using the language for the past week. And I thought, you know what, Lynch, just let yourself go. The, if the president does it, dot, it, dot, dot. If the president does it, in my mind, it does not make it right, especially this president. So I, I just thought we'd, we'd comment, you know, Cambridge and Somerville are not dissimilar when it comes to its politics. You know, people, people jokingly say, you know, it's, it's the sister city, it's the twin city, uh, but we do have differences. We do have differences in the way that we do things. But I tend to think of them as being very similar in um, the, the makeup of the people being, like we, we definitely have some like long lasting uh, residents, but those are also made of some long lasting immigrant families in Cambridge. Sure. Where, uh, 
heavily Portuguese, uh, we're actually heavily Irish. Um, and, and then we have like the, the huge, the spectrum of people, the rainbow of people that come to uh, attend the universities, uh, and you've got that as well. I just we do. It's a it's a very permeable border. I, I do think of Somerville and Cambridge as being very similar, and and a lot of reactions to. I think the city should merge. To be honest with you, I think I think the two cities should merge so we can take advantage of your huge commercial tax base. <laughs> but you would have to keep all of the universities and the not for profits on that side of the border because they don't pay taxes. We'll take their their pilot payments. We'll take their payments in lieu of taxes. We'll take those, but. I think Somerville and Cambridge should not merge because we need some place to live <laughs> that's more <laughs> reasonable. We need better, as soon as you cross the border, our rents are like a couple hundred dollars cheaper. Fair I point. I had a friend who's able to buy a house in Somerville, could not buy a house in Cambridge. Right, fair point. Now, when you watch what happened in both cities, though, um, Cambridge has a slightly different form of government. Um, they have councillors, and you have ranked voting. Um, by bicameral, it's a bicameral system over there, but you still have a mayor. We have a weak mayor and a strong city manager. I know that uh, one of your candidates, who's just elected, is actually um, very down on the strong mayor system. Yes, at least one. Yep, yep. And and he was elected. Yep. Was that going to get any traction? Well, you know, they tried this a few years ago in terms of changing the city charter to give the legislative body more power and take some away from the mayor. So of course, the mayor is not going to endorse that unless you get a very, very, I'm not talking specifically about Joe Cardatoni, I'm talking about any strong mayor form of government, that mayor is not going to endorse giving over power to the legislative body. The legislative body, once they get in, they would not endorse giving more power to the mayor. So I, I think it's kind of a catch-22, and it's, it's a stalemate for now, unless there is a groundswell in the city of Somerville to change the city charter, take away some of the powers of the mayor and give it over to the Board of Aldermen. So I think it's, I think it's uh, dead. I That's think, my opinion. I think your J.T. Scott also was of the opinion that there needed to be more attention given to the appointed uh, boards and commissions. Yes. And... I think that is an issue that would resonate in Cambridge uh, somewhat. Uh, we have seen so much controversy in the past couple few years over the License Commission. Um, and when people went looking for oversight and for some responsible party, what we got was a lot of the, the city council saying, well, we don't really have that power, and the city manager saying, we don't really have that power. and. Uh, some terrible things resulted. Hmm. Uh, a lot of business owners have been hurt or will be hurt by some of those policies. Well, it's interesting because I, I, you know, I read Cambridge Day. You know that. I like to keep up on what happens over in Cambridge as well. Thank you for the pitch, you. There you go. Pitch, pitch, plug, plug. Um, but one of the articles that just appeared um, a week ago was you talking about, you writing an article for Cambridge Day about televising the round table discussions in Cambridge. Can you, I mean, we look at some of our committee meetings and they're enough to put no-dos out of business. You know, I mean, they're boring, they're laborious. I give all the credit in the world to the board, you know, the legislative side that they slog through these orders and the resolutions and all the rest of it. But some of the major decisions are made behind closed doors. Now, even though those those meetings are open to the public, they're not televised. And we all know that technology has come a long way, uh, so why not televise those roundtable discussions or committee meetings? Why not? Because roundtables are magic, Joe. Because <laughs> somehow, and uh, that sounds like a joke, it's really not. We've actually had um, legislators who have said that there is something magical about a roundtable and uh, that people go into them and they speak more freely and... Because they can call certain nations shitholes? I mean, is that kind of the logic that it's they have? It's really, it's never been clear to me. And the logic, such as it is, has never made sense to me because 
it's basically saying that for every meeting that is not a roundtable, and we have 52 you know, weeks in a year, and theoretically our, you know, our bodies are meeting every week or so, mm -hmm. um, six to 12 of those might be roundtables. So now you have to do the math and assume that for every meeting that's held that is not a roundtable, you have appointed officials coming in and giving, city staff coming in, and giving testimony and advice that is not as good as you'd get at roundtables. It's like, that's, uh, that's a terrible idea. But the idea is that, you know, they're gonna dig in and hear, I don't know, they're just gonna talk casually, and somehow that is uh, impossible if the cameras are not just on, but also recording and streaming and broadcasting. And so the defense basically is, is that some people are very camera shy and they would be less forthcoming or less transparent if they knew the camera was on them. Is that their logic? That is the logic, that is a story. So, so much for any political candidate who runs on transparency, but does not want their conversations recorded when it comes to our government. And the craziest thing, of course, is that you're right, uh, the technology is so easy to use these days that we have had people, residents, citizens coming in and setting up a laptop or setting up a camera and they're recording those meetings, they're streaming them, they're archiving them and making them more accessible to people. They are public meetings. Right. People can attend. Open to the public. They're recorded anyway because the clerk is going to use the audio to make minutes out of them. Right. So uh, increasingly uh, the arguments make no sense and it has become a very sad tradition at Cambridge Day to ask that this be the final year, the final term, that round tables <laughs> are treated this way. And I think that we finally have bodies that are tilting in the direction of sanity. In fact, the school committee in Cambridge is probably deciding tonight on at least a partial breaking of this ban, and uh, that might really help tilt it. And yeah. I bring, I bring it forward only because, you know, part of what we're going to talk about tonight, Mark, is the changing of the guard. You know, Cambridge had uh, four seats over in the, the last election in November. You had four newcomers come in. Right. And in Somerville, we had five of the 11 alderman seats change. So it appears as though... I'm sorry, I have to correct you. We had sorry. three. Uh, three of our candidates opted not to run. Right. Every candidate right. that did opt to run for their body got reelected. Right. So. Right, right. Your incumbents got reelected, but you have four newbies, basically four newbies on the on the council. We have five newbies on the council. One of ours chose not to run and that was an uh, uncontested. And uh Okay, I'm so, I'm sorry. I thought cuz your our revolution endorsed candidates. Yes, that did uh, we had four out of five of our, our revolution candidates elected, and you had, I thought it was six out of six, but it's... Uh, no. Okay. No. We had, um, there was an incumbent who was endorsed by our revolution, ah. and then there was two, three, uh, two and three, uh, wards two and three were our revolution candidates who had opponents. Ward four was an our revolution candidate with no opponent, and then, yeah. So okay. we kind of had a mix. We had a mix of them. But, but my point, trying to get to the point here, is that there's a changing of the guard. You know, no longer will you see, and no offense to Tim Toomey, I don't think any longer will you see, you know, 17-term um, elected officials on local boards. I think that we're changing very, very quickly. Um, there are groups that are out there that are no longer going to let certain groups run the show. So they're organized, their candidates are being heavily funded by the, by the groups themselves, and they're getting into the position where they can make those types of changes that we were talking about in terms of the round table. So it's gonna be interesting for me, this old white guy sitting here, trying to see if they put their money where their mouth is. In both, both cities, both Cambridge and Somerville, will they take up this, this call this clarion call to start being more transparent. You know, there are committee meetings that are going on for the Board of Aldermen. There are planning board, zoning board, 
licensing commission, all those things. Those, in my opinion, are part of the mix. It's not just the board, the city council meetings that should be televised. It's not just the school committee or the board of aldermen. It's where a lot of the work is done behind the scenes. So I loved the article because I just kind of morphed it into Somerville saying, you know, I, when I ran, you know I ran for office years ago, and I wanted the planning board meetings televised. I wanted people to understand where and how the planning board makes its decisions. Not without political interference sometimes by the city councilors and the board of aldermen. So just my thoughts. Your it's interesting thoughts. that uh, I think you're right, and I think that's one of the reasons why things are tilting in that direction. Uh, but we have a move toward aligning better the efforts toward transparency that the city makes in terms of planning board, BZA, things like that. There are all these different standards for when they post their minutes and how they post their minutes and whether they have transcripts and whether it's filmed. Mm -hmm. And so we've taken steps in the recent past and are continuing on a path toward um, everything being filmed, everything having transcripts, and everything being posted at a certain time. And the commission that's had the most controversy, the license commission, is taking a step back. It had searchable transcripts, and now it's going to a, a system where they're just recording and posting the audio. Hmm. And of course, you can see the trouble where that's almost impossible to use as research. Suddenly, you have to listen to an entire hour or two hours or however long of a meeting, and then another one and then another one to build any sort of a pattern, whereas in the past, you could go to the transcripts and just search for text. And this was ostensibly a cost-saving measure that was undertaken at no one's request. And uh, they've even taken to uh, posting the agendas and minutes as an image instead of a searchable text. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure they have reasons for this that they could tell you, but it's, it's very clear like what's going on. Um, so, well, let me put it this way. Here in Somerville, I, I have to give kudos to, to the city. Our website has been redone, I don't know how many times in the last 10 years, in order to make it more friendly, more searchable, and more information out, out there. Still, though, remains to be seen that where the lion's share of decisions or pseudo decisions are being made are at the commission level or the committee level, and those are not publicized. I would actually give a lot of credit to Somerville for transparency and ease of use. As an example, Somerville long ago had um, sections of video that are connected to agenda items. And mm -hmm. so when you go looking for an agenda item, you only have to watch that video. Right. Cambridge made an attempt to follow suit in a system that was so confusing that even after I was shown how to use it, I could not, and I actually do not know at this point if that system is still in place. Uh, in addition, uh, your budget book mm -hmm. is more detailed. There are line items in there where you can search and see w exactly, for instance, how much um, an employee of the city makes. Whereas in Cambridge, the step has been away from that kind of detail into an all over, the department has this much money, and it's very difficult to track what goes to what replaced by a data portal that you need training to know how to use. So in fancy Cambridge, you know, theoretically, if you've got a degree in computer science, then yes, you can use your open data portal and pull out this information. <coughs> Excuse but not me. everyone does. <coughs> well, let me dig down into that. Do you think <coughs> in Cambridge you have a city manager who basically reports to the council, correct? Yes and no. So if the city manager, if the council is telling the city manager, we don't think you should do things that way because it makes it too easy for somebody to find out how much XYZ makes, Department of you know, DPW or Chief of Police. Uh, do you think that that's the downside of having a city manager? We have an effort that we've seen over the past few years to overturn Plan E. We've had at least one candidate running over the past couple terms that simply wants to tear down that system that puts in place the city manager. 
uh, he believes that it leads to more corruption and less accountability. Uh, I don't know that I would go that far. The city manager does have a lot of leeway in the running of the city. Mm -hmm. And if the city council is focused on bigger policy and other areas of policy, then that nuts and bolts stuff is going to fall by the wayside and the city manager can control that. So the city manager really acts as the CEO and the council, council acts as almost like a board of directors. That's accurate. That they're not supposed to be getting involved in stuff like that. That's correct. I mean, they're setting direction, they're setting strategy. Yeah, I got it. Well, you know, the same could be said for a strong mayoral form of government here. Um, we have a very strong form of government and a lot of times you have the legislative body locking horns with the mayor over policy. And the, the good side, I don't know, some people may disagree with me, the good side is our Board of Aldermen cannot fire the mayor. And the mayor cannot fire the Board of Aldermen. He can certainly make it difficult when it comes to election time. But, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a debatable issue, and I think it's always going to be out there depending on the type of government that you have. I don't know what's behind it, but I did note with a degree of alarm that um, it's Joe Curtitone and it's Boston's Marty Walsh that are leading this regional effort toward uh, housing affordability, mm. and that even though our current mayor, who was just appointed January 1st, this happened a little bit before that, mm -hmm. even though our current mayor had already been involved in regional efforts having to do with homelessness, for instance, and was in touch with these players, he was cut out. Mm. Cambridge was sort of cut out of that, and it was announced after the fact. And by the way, Cambridge is also a part of this regional group that is being led by Somerville's Joker to Tone and Boston's Marty Walsh. Mm. And that's a pretty big thing. Why do you think it happened, though? I, don't, I, I didn't follow that part of it, but why do you think they would have done that? I cannot say. I don't know that it's tied to having a city manager rather than having a mayor with a personality who is engaged and in touch with mm. um, uh, Joe Curtitone and, and Marty Walsh, for instance, but having a city manager that is more focused on nuts and bolts day-to-day -day running might have kept that kind of uh, large conceptual thinking from, from taking place. Hmm. But I don't know why Cambridge sort of brought in as well, a I'll minor Kurt, player. I'll ask Mayor Critter Tony the next time I see him. How come you cut Mark McGovern out of this whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he'll fair, give me a very transparent answer on that. To be fair, you know, what happens is that there's no mayor for a while. You know right, there's right. current mayor's going to be, you know, disappearing and uh, some new mayor will be elected. And we've been very lucky. I don't know if it's luck, actually, but we've had a mayor... Um, on the first day, on the inauguration day, two terms in a row, and before that, it would take until February, late yeah, February. You, you guys used March. to slog through the elected because there were so many different factions. You had friends, and then you had the old guard, and you had the new guard. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that. Um, but I did notice it. I read, you know, in, in reading Cambridge Day that, um, you know, that the president, the new mayor, and the vice mayor were elected right there on January 1st. So just happened to have his speech all prepared in his breast pocket when he came out and just read it. Yeah. Let's talk about um, what's coming up this year. We're gonna have statewide elections. Charlie Baker in trouble, or does Charlie Baker get reelected um, in a walk? Well, if Donald Trump can get away with what Donald Trump is getting away with, I'm gonna say Charlie Baker gets reelected. So we got three Democratic candidates so far, Seti Warren, um, Jay Gonzalez and Bob Massey. Bob but Massey being a hometown Somerville boy. But we know that that Massachusetts is crazy this way, or not crazy this way. And because we like the check and balance. Yeah. Yeah. We love the Republican governors. Yeah. And that's that's all they get. So so I'm gonna put you on the spot. Charlie Baker doing a good job or a bad job? Mediocre job? Give him a grade. I feel it's out of my pay grade. I uh, come on. So focused on the local Joe. I, uh, let's give it a C. C? C? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, people know my leaning. The, I, would, I would, at this point, give Charlie a B minus. Oh, okay. I give him it's a, a B radical, minus. It's a radical departure. I give him a B minus. I mean, you know, some of his transportation, 
I, did I say transportation? Some of, the, some of the people who've run some of the cabinet positions, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. You did say transportation. I'm going to be locked out of her office the next time I go up there. But uh, yeah, you know, I just look at it that, you, you know, based on some of the other national political figures that we have that are hitting the news these days and not for good reasons, Charlie's keeping his head low. Um, he's not making any major uh, snafus. Now, there are a lot of things that I disagree with Charlie Baker over. Um, you know, his handling of certain issues that have come front and center. But I think, you know, Charlie is smart enough that he's not going to endorse uh, somebody like a Donald Trump. He's not going to put his neck on the line for somebody like that. Um, I, I, sometimes I wish Charlie would have a little bit more compassion for people who need compassion. Um, and less feelings about the nuts and bolts of numbers. But I think he's also very conscious that, uh, you know, Massachusetts is not Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville. It's also... Right. Massachusetts is actually uh, surprisingly conservative, even to the extreme, we've learned. Um, I think he plays it pretty well, and I, I, I haven't seen any candidate other than him sort of catch fire. Mm. Mm. And the, what are they, 14 Republicans left inside of the 128 belt? That sounds about right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm getting fresh. So uh, we got a couple of more minutes, though. Let me, let, me go back to, um, let me go back to something that people may not be thinking about. But we also have two newer entrants um, in the statewide legislature. legislature. So we have uh, Christine Barber, who is the state rep from Medford Somerville. Um, and we have Mike Conley, who represents part of Cambridge, part of Somerville. Those are two of the fairly newer entrants. And I know I'm going to get in trouble for asking this question, but uh, Denise Provo, who is the state rep solely for, for the vast majority of Somerville. But State Senator Pat Jalen uh, represents part of Cambridge, part of Somerville, Medford. Who do you see? trying to fill that when she decides that she's done? Do you see it Mike Conley, or do you see it Christine Barber, or do you see somebody else coming out? We know that Leland Chung took a run at her. I am also really reluctant to uh, get into this. I admire Mike Connolly greatly. I, when I am approached by cynics about politics, I tell them, well, I know a guy who hasn't lost his, I think is a serious uh, man of the people, the classic man of the people, and I might give it to him. I'm going to leave it at that.